This video is part two of chapter 14. And in this part of chapter 14, we are going to look at inheritance patterns that are not as simple as the Mendelian patterns that we saw before, where there is one dominant and one recessive trait, and that the dominant is always expressed if it's present. The relationship between genotype and phenotype is rarely that simple. And many heritable characters are not determined by only one gene with only two alleles. But the basic principles of segregation and independent assortment still apply. <coughs> Inheritance of characters by a single gene can deviate from the simple Mendelian patterns we've seen before. Some examples of this include when alleles are not completely dominant or recessive, when there may be more than two alleles for a gene, or when a gene produces multiple phenotypes. And we're going to get into examples of all of these. <clears throat> First, let's look at degrees of dominance. In simple Mendelian traits, complete dominance is what occurs. And that's when the phenotypes of the heterozygote and the homozygous dominant individual are identical. In some cases, dominance is incomplete where neither allele is dominant to the other or recessive to the other. And so therefore, the F1 doesn't look like either one of the parents. An example of that is snapdragon flowers. Now notice that we label our alleles a little bit differently than what we've seen before. In this case, the allele is represented by two letters, not just one. So the character is color, so that's capital C, and then the R here indicates red. So CR is the red allele. <clears throat> by contrast, CW would be the white allele. So these are still only two alleles. They're not four alleles, they're just one. They just happen to be represented by two letters. So in these flowers, a pure breeding or true breeding red flower has both R alleles and is red. A true breeding white flower has both white alleles and it's white. So if we do go through segregation and produce gametes, this individual is going to produce a red allele gamete and this individual is going to produce a gamete with a white allele. Well, when those two get together, the offspring are pink. So they are in between the parents. This is sort of an example of the blending that we saw earlier, the beginning of chapter 14. If we breed the F1s together, notice what happens in the F2. We still get one of each allele in the sperm and the egg, but notice that there's not a three to one ratio anymore. There's red, pink, and white flowers represented in the offspring. That is because the red is not dominant to the white. And that's how come you get the mixture here, or the blending. Some alleles um, have multiple copies, more than two copies, I should say, for particular characters. An example of that is in the phenotypes of the ABO blood groups in humans. There are actually three different alleles. There's the capital IA, capital IB, which are both dominant, and then the little i, which is recessive. <clears throat> what these encode for is a particular carbohydrate that is found on the surface of the human blood cell. We'll see that here in a second. The other thing that human blood types exhibit is a phenomenon known as codominance. And in codominance, two dominant alleles affect the phenotype in separate and distinguishable ways. So if we look at human blood types, first of all, there are multiple alleles. We have the IA, IB, and little i. Notice also that we have multiple phenotypes. So for example, if an individual is IAIA or IA little i, they are type A. By the same token, if they have the, these B genotypes, they're type B. But notice if they're IAIB, they are type AB. So both of these dominant alleles are expressed. And then the little i little i is the recessive phenotype, which is type O. Another non-Mendelian trait, and that's what all of these are called that we've talked about so far, or non-Mendelian inheritance patterns is epistasis, and this is where two genes are involved at, at a minimum. And in this case, one gene can affect the expression of another gene. Labrador retrievers are a really good example of this because they show two genes for the color of their coat. So the one gene determines the pigment color or the color of the coat, and it's going to be either black or brown, which, with black being dominant and brown being recessive. The other gene with alleles dominant E for color and little e for no color determines whether the pigment will be present or deposited in the hair. So if we look at the example here, these individuals are both black labs because they've got a big B, little b, and they've got an E which allows the expression of the 
um, pigment and a little e which doesn't. But let's take a look at individuals that have the two little e's. Regardless of what the B gene is, they are all yellow labs. So what happens is this little e, little e genotype masks the expression of the B gene no matter what it is. So epistasis can also be called gene masking. Many human traits actually do follow Mendelian patterns of inheritance, and we're going to look at a couple of those. It's hard to do genetic research on humans for a number of reasons. First of all, the generation time is too long. It takes nine months to produce offspring. In addition, very few offspring are usually produced. You rarely see multiple births. And then lastly, and really the most important reason, is it's not ethical to do breeding experiments with humans. However, Mendelian genetics is we can use Mendelian genetics to understand how different traits in humans are passed on from one generation to the next. One of the ways that scientists can figure out how a trait is inherited or passed on in humans is by doing a family tree called a pedigree. And what they do is they track a family, they look at traits, they look at one particular trait, for example, and then they show genotypes or phenotypes of the individuals and try to figure out the genotypes. Here's what a pedigree looks like for Widow's Peak, for example. Widow's Peak is a dominant trait where you have a pointy hairline. You can see that on this woman right here. No Widow's Peak is a straight hairline. So we can set up a pedigree here to try to figure out if the Widow's Peak is dominant or recessive. Now since it's fairly prevalent and we've got lots of it here found here in the family, we could predict that it's a dominant trait. Okay, So that's an example of a pedigree. Let's first talk about some of the human disorders that are genetic and that are inherited in a recessive manner. There's, a, there's many of them. We're just going to talk about a couple of them. Some are fairly mild. Others are life-threatening. What's interesting about recessive alleles, as we already know, is that an individual can be heterozygous and not express the recessive allele. Now, well, it's no different in human diseases that are genetic. But if an individual human is heterozygous for a particular um, disease, gene, we call them a carrier. So if the normal gene is dominant, they can carry the recessive gene, which is the disease gene, and be carriers of it. Albinism, or the lack of pigment in skin and hair in humans, is an example of that. Here we have two parents who were normal, meaning they, didn't, they weren't albino, but they have a one in four chance of producing a child who is albino. So we can use the Mendelian principles of segregation and also a Punnett square to predict whether or not they're going to have any albino children. And here you can see the two little girls here that are sisters. You can see there's a major difference in how much pigment they express. Another recessively inherited disorder in humans is sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. It affects primarily African Americans and that's mostly kind of an evolutionary thing that's more really just a chance thing and we'll talk more about that in class. But what it what happens is there was a single amino acid substitution in the hemoglobin protein in red blood cells and it causes the red blood cells to not carry oxygen properly and it also causes them to be misshapen. But you have to be homozygous recessive to have the disease. But again, an individual can be a carrier by being heterozygous. Some disorders are actually dominant and are caused by dominant alleles. One of those is what we call achondroplasia. This is a form of dwarfism. In this situation, a dwarf individual and a normal individual could have children and therefore have both because the dwarfism is the dominant trait. So notice here, if the individual is heterozygous, they are a dwarf. In order to be normal size, they'd have to be homozygous recessive. And here's a picture of a gentleman who's a dwarf. Another recessively inherited disease is Huntington disease. And Huntington's disease is a particularly interesting one because it is what is called a late onset disease. So there's no obvious phenotypic expression in the individual who has the disease until they're about 35 to 40 years old. So it can be problematic for those individuals if they don't know that they had it because they could have had kids by that time and already passed it on. And what it does is it causes a degeneration of the nervous system and is ultimately fatal. Other diseases are what we call multifactorial. And what that means is there's a genetic component, but there are also environmental components. So um, influences in the environment can cause 
the disorder to pop up. Things like heart disease, where you could have genes for heart problems, but then if your diet is high in fat, you're going to contribute to the heart disease in a, to a greater degree. Alcoholism, mental illnesses, other things like that are also multifactorial. So in these cases, the environment as well as lifestyle can have a significant impact on the phenotype. How we test for and treat these kinds of disorders is through what's called genetic testing and genetic counseling. People can be tested if they, to see if they carry individual alleles. That's pretty expensive, um, and not everybody has the opportunity to, to use that type of technology. But genetic counseling can be very help, helpful where you meet with a counselor, and what they do is they'll do pedigrees with you. They'll set up the family trees that we saw before, and they can give you at least some idea of the chances of passing on a particular trait should it be prevalent in your family. There are lots of fetal tests as well, and two in particular are amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. In amniocentesis, what happens is a needle is inserted into a woman's uterus, and fluid that bathes the fetus is removed and tested. Now, that fluid has fetal cells, so they can be removed and tested for chromosomal abnormalities and other things. Chorionic villus sampling is a little bit different, and what happens there is part of the placenta is removed and tested, and that placenta also contains fetal cells. So they can be, similar tests can be done on those as were done in amniocentesis. And then there's things like ultrasounds and fetoscopies that they can see what the baby looks like and how it's doing inside the uterus. Here's an example of amniocentesis. You can see the needle is, is inserted into the uterus, Fluid is taken out and then the cells are tested and you can see with chorionic villus sampling the needle is inserted through the vagina and then placental cells are removed and those also contain um, fetal cells and then those can be tested. Notice one of the tests can, that can be done is a karyotype. 